Well, we're, oops, did I turn that off? I turned it off. We're going to start a new series today, and, and the series is called Can of Worms. How do you like our worms? It's kind of like the gummy worms that you guys had. How many of you ate them already? There's a couple honest people out there. You know, I meant to ask earlier, too, are we divided on who's going to, by who's, which team is going to win? Is that how we're sitting today? 49ers, I hear. Hmm? Even in that type of relationship, you know, when it's uh, centered on a, a sporting event, we can be, uh, we, we can find difficulties in the relationships. And that's the key, is it's hard being in relationship with people, whether we know them very well or we don't. Have you ever met somebody that you did not want to be a part of your group? Have you? Sometimes being in, an, in a relationship can be difficult because people are different. People don't think like we do. People don't act like us. They don't have the same goals or, or maybe even the same morals or, or things that, uh, that they go after. Maybe they're just completely an oddball to us. And it's hard to be in a relationship with somebody like that. When I was at the uh, University of Maryland, I remember my last capstone course that I had to take. And it was a, a practicum course. And what it was, was uh, I majored in industrial arts education and we had to develop a company, we had to develop a product, we had to sell it, we had to finance it, we had to advertise it, we had to do absolutely everything um, as a group in the form of a business in order to complete this course. Well. I don't know how, I really don't remember how, but somehow I was nominated to be the president of the company. Oh, okay, that's cool, I can do that. The problem is, I didn't get to pick my employees. I was stuck with the people that were in the class. Now, as you can imagine, some of those people I had a good relationship with and they were, you know, they were team players, man, they were all about it. There was others that were just duds. They were there, you know, you know, they were just sleeping away. They were doing nothing. And yet I'm supposed to manage these people. I'm supposed to be in relationship with these people. It created all kinds of challenges, all kinds of cans of worms, if you will, because I dealt with people that had different life experiences, different impressions of what we were supposed to be doing. They had different ideas about how things were supposed to go. Is this sounding familiar? Does it sound like a relationship in your life where maybe it's a little challenging sometimes? Yeah. Well, what do we do about that? It's hard. Just because somebody is different from us doesn't mean that that person is of any less value. Should they be of any less value to us? It doesn't mean that they're of any less value to God. It really doesn't. Even the most difficult person or the weirdest person or the most far out person you can think of right now, it doesn't mean that that person is, is of any less value to God than you are. Now that's a difficult concept. I know it was for me to really kind of try and understand. It doesn't mean that because somebody's different that they shouldn't be recognized. It doesn't mean that they don't have a, a purpose that was ordained by God. Absolutely they do. God hasn't done anything in this universe imperfectly. He hasn't created one person that doesn't have a place in his creation. That doesn't have, you know, something that they're supposed to be doing. That they're, that they're maybe they're doing it, but that they're designed to do and, and even if we don't understand it. And I would, I would submit to you that most of the time we don't understand what God is doing through another person because we don't see it all. We just see the outside. We just see where they go and what they do and we're like, hmm. Whereas internally, maybe that person is being changed into the image of Christ. Maybe that person is leading another one alongside of him in that journey. I mean, there's so much going on that we don't have, we're just not privy to it. 
We're not privy to it at all. Sometimes we have to look past the reasons that we don't want to include somebody. They're different. They're much bigger than the rest of us, or whatever the case might be. Sometimes we have to realize that maybe they're an odd duck, but it doesn't mean that they're a bad duck. We have to realize that not everybody maybe enhances our group in the way that we would expect them to. Maybe getting to know somebody is something that, that changes who you are later in life. I can think of a few people in my life that have been that way. You ever been on the ball field, you know, you're a kid and everybody's kind of grouping together and picking out who's going to be on what team? You ever, how many of you have done that? Here at the Rosebush Park, you know, you're out there and you're picking sides. Who's going to be on my team, you know? And what's it like to be the last one picked? It can be hurtful. But it doesn't mean that they're not a good player. It doesn't mean that they're not a nice person. Usually what it means is, you know, well, they're just not the most popular person, maybe. Or maybe we have a, a whole group of outstanding players to pick from, and that's just the way it worked out. Who knows? But in all cases, when it comes to our relationship with people, we need to remember the words that, um, that Paul writes in the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians 1.5, it says this, He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, to himself. He predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself according to his kind intention of, of his will. What's he saying? He's saying that absolutely everybody that you will encounter today has been offered the opportunity to be a, a part of the kingdom of God. In other words, God is play, placing a tremendous amount of value on that individual that you're looking at and you might be judging at the same time. Now, I, I admit I'm guilty, okay? I do that sometimes. I'm not proud of it. I don't like it. Sometimes I, I humanly look at an individual and I've already got this judgment stuff going on in my mind. Am I the only one? And yet... I got to realize, I got to tell myself that this is a tremendously valued child of God here. Now, maybe they're lost or maybe, I mean, I don't know, but I have to ask myself also the question, what is it, God, that I can do to help this individual know you in a deeper way? And at the same time, hopefully it'll change me a little bit so that I know them in a little bit deeper way. What do I need to do? How can I do that? It's... It's part of the deal. You, you get to know people, and there are worms of all different kinds and sizes, and they're not all gummies. Sometimes they taste nasty. That's the way it works. I'm reminded of a story. Remember the story in the Bible where Jesus is walking along, and there's a whole crowd of people around him, and they're, they're talking with him, and they're, you know, everybody's vying for his attention, and, and they're going down this road, and there's this little dude who's up in a tree. Remember him? How many of you remember who I'm talking about? Zacchaeus. And when there's a little song Darth started singing, I can't remember it. Does anybody know it? What is it? That's it. So Zacchaeus is this little dude, and... This crowd is among Jesus, and, and Zacchaeus wants to make sure he sees this Messiah. So he jumps up into a tree, and what does Jesus do? Does he ignore him? No. How many of us would, in a group of people, while we're getting all this attention, all these people are vying for our attention and our time and all, and, and you got all these people, how many of us would just walk right by? And yet Jesus, he, he teaches us this tremendous story, I mean, this tremendous value of God in that all people, 
whether they're big or small or whatever, standing up in the tree, acting like a fool, you know, or they're in the crowd and they're selfish or whatever, you know, or, they, or they've got the best of intentions. He says, everyone is tremendously valued by God. So much so that we know Christ came and died for those people. Regardless of the personal habits, regardless of, regardless of any personality issues, uh, their past, regardless of the past, it makes no difference. You know, one of the most difficult concepts is to understand that God looks at sin as sin. Listen to me. We put everything on a sliding scale. I don't see that in Scripture anywhere. I don't see it anywhere. I don't see where God says, well, this sin is not as bad as that sin. I don't see that anywhere. If somebody can find that, please let me know. And I will humbly apologize to you all. But what I see is that God says a sin is sin. It's when you don't matter, when you don't match up to the righteousness that I am, that who I am, then that's it. you're just, you're sinful. That's it. And yet Jesus, this day, is ignoring all of the faults that this little man has in front of all these people that many of them probably thought that they were all that. And yet Jesus goes over there and he, he engages this man in a conversation, he engages him in a relationship, and, and we know the rest of the story. Jesus goes to his house and all of these things. Jesus demonstrates for us that the door, that the door of opportunity to know God is open to all people, regardless of worms, regardless of issues, regardless of anything. It's all there. It's open if we only accept the opportunity and walk through the door. That's the key. You got to choose it. You got to want it. I can sit up here all day or anybody can stand up here all day and tell you what you need to do. But if you don't want to do it, it's just smoke and mirrors. It really is. If you don't want to really do something, it's, it's stupid to pursue it. If you don't want to know Christ, you're wasting your time. Now, I know that's probably not the most, you know, sensitive message, but it's true. I, I got to share what I conceive or what I see the scriptures telling me is truth. And Jesus many times addressed people that were doing things outwardly and, and, you know, for show and for all the wrong reasons. And he keeps telling them, he keeps leading them right back to the point that if you don't want to know me, then everything you're doing is a waste of time. You may be polishing the outside of the cup, so to speak, but if the inside of the cup is still wretched, you missed the point. You missed the point. How tragic would it be to stand before Christ one day and have him shake his head and say, you missed the point. I can't think of a worse situation. My goodness. Let me tell you what, friends. A hundred years from now, that's the only thing that's going to make any difference in your life is whether or not you understood that concept of you need to want to know Christ. And one of the most blessed parts of the scripture says that if you really want to, it says, if, a man, if the heart of a man wants to know God, he promises that you will find him. If you want to know him, then you will find him. Jesus, that day that he's walking along with those people and Zacchaeus, he showed Zacchaeus what the love of God was all about. Now remember, Usually when we want to know what love is, we turn to the book of 1 Corinthians. Always we turn there when it's wedding day. And we remember the words that were written to the Corinthians. Love is patient. It's kind. Doesn't envy. Doesn't boast. Not proud. Doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's humble. It's not easily angered. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. 
Listen to me. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with truth. It protects, it trusts, it hopes, and it always seems to persevere. If you look at what Jesus was doing that day in that context of what 1 Corinthians tells us, Jesus exemplified all of those things. To this poor man in a tree, he was one of the outcasts of society. He probably didn't have a friend there that day. And yet Jesus shows him the love and the trust and the, I mean, all of those things. Why? Because that's the deal. We're called to be in relationship with people. I'll share with you a little personal experience. Sometimes I go to different places to, to write. You know, I might be getting the car worked on or I might be meeting somebody or whatever. And, and you know, I bring my laptop and I'll do some writing. There's one guy at this particular place that I run into periodically, and he is the most obnoxious, the most self-centered, the most egotistical jerk I have ever met in my life. And I mean that. This guy rubs me wrong from, I, I can't, I mean, I'm, I feel nauseous right now just thinking about the guy, okay? I mean, it, it's horrible. But I gotta remember that this is a dearly loved, valued child of God. That he's the Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus to me, you know? I can't just walk by him. I can't ignore him like, like we do sometimes, you know? You know, oh, I don't wanna say, oh, so-and-so's in a restaurant, I'll just ignore him, you know? Because if I see him, I'll have to talk to him. That's, that's not what Jesus would do. That's not what we're called to do have to remember those words. He predestined us to adoptions as sons or daughters through Jesus Christ to himself. In essence, God has created all of the universe, all of life itself, with the open invitation to come and join me in heaven as it was always meant to be, if you're ready. It's easy, easier, I should say, sometimes for kids to go up to somebody that they don't know, somebody that's down on their luck or someone that's homeless or whatever, and offer them something. Why? Because they don't usually see all of the different obstacles that you and I see. I think that's part of the reason Jesus said uh, in this crowd one day, and he took a little kid to him, and he says, unless you become like one of these, you got nothing to do with me. He's talking about the heart of a kid. He's talking about, as it says up here, childlike faith. He's saying, get rid of the obstacles. Get rid of the worms. Don't worry about them. They're just obstacles. They're just things that get in the way. Realize that you are a tremendously valued person, child of God, and that so is your neighbor. Now, we're doing a study on, on Sunday mornings here in this book, Searching for God Knows What is the name of the book. And this is, I think, important. I'm going to read a little section to you. Jesus, by imitating what we call communion, disciplines such as fasting and the sacrament of baptism, takes the spiritual disciplines from the abstract realm of religion and places them within the meaningful realm of relationship. Fasting is mourning him. Baptism is identifying with him. Communion is remembering him. It all comes down to our thoughts and feelings and faith in him. If our minds are not on Christ and we treat communion like a little religious pill or baptism like a woo-woo bath or we feel fast or we fast to feel some kind of pain about sacrifice 
The significance is gone. Again, it gets right back to the relationship. You can come here and do this because we always do it on the first Sunday of every month. I hate that. You know why? Because it's repetitious and many times we fall into that. Uh, it's what we do today. It's got to be about the relationship. It's got to be the remembrance that we come to this table to participate in the only way that we can, the best way that we can, and remember the sacrifice of Christ on our behalf. On our behalf. Now, I don't know about you, but that's pretty good news. That God would sacrifice himself for someone like me is the best news that I've heard in a long time. Would our communion ushers come, come forward this morning? I'm going to pull it out a little bit because I know I'm going to trip. And I don't want to trip. I've done that before and it didn't, wasn't fun. Thank you. So as you come here this morning, I want you to remember it's about the relationship. And then ask yourself, do I ever devalue other people? Do I ever look down on another individual? And what am I going to do with that? Because I tell you, Jesus didn't. And there are so many examples in Scripture of where Jesus didn't, prophets didn't, God doesn't. It's what he calls us into, that type of a, of a humble relationship. The night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, this is my body which will be given for you, which will be sacrificed for you, to be broken in half for you. And I'm not making any different ideas about who it's for and who it's not. Jesus said it's for you, for all. And he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of my blood, the blood of a new and an everlasting covenant. Listen to the words I'm saying. A new and everlasting covenant, an agreement between the two of us. That you can be a child of God, guaranteed the relationship with God that you've always intended to have. It's always been there for you if you simply accept it.